Okay, so today we're talking about how did the second Industrial Revolution affect Europe. Just because you thought, just when you thought we were done with the Industrial Revolution, there is a second Industrial Revolution. Now, before I start talking, I have to give you the same warning or reminder. This is only a couple of minutes after I made the first video that you listened to for Monday Night's Homework. So my wall is still coming down downstairs, so therefore there's still sorts of crazy noises. So if you hear anything, that's what it is. It's a wall being torn down downstairs. Okay, so... I guess we're talking about how did the second industrial revolution affect Europe. And I want us to think before we start talking about this, why did many Europeans leave their homes to come here? And I want you to think about that because that process is going on during the second industrial revolution. If you think back to eighth grade and learning about immigration, the first wave of immigration that was happening during this time period. And we're also going to be writing eventually a CCO, CCOT on long-term migration patterns that occurred during this time period. So, let's get to the first most obvious question. What the heck... Oh, sorry. Later. Sorry about that. I keep wanting me to restart my computer to update. So, what was the Second Industrial Revolution, you might ask, since we're talking about it? So, in basically, the Second Industrial Revolution is focused more on iron than the making of steel, because a man by the name of Henry Bessemer, and I will spell his name for you, he came up with, he was an English engineer, and he came up with a way that was known as the Bessemer process. He figured out how to make steel cheaply and in large quantities. So steel becomes a major um, industry during the Second Industrial Revolution. In the 1860s, Great Britain Belgium, France, and Germany combined produced 125,000 tons of steel. By 1913, it's over 32 million tons of steel. So we can see that's where a large emphasis is. In addition, because we start seeing the movement into steel, but we also see things being made in out of iron. So iron is being used to produce bridges, to produce ships, um, rather than things being made out of wood. And then we also see once the introduction of steam comes in, those get applied to ships, and we start to see um, iron and steel becoming a major part of the Second Industrial Revolution. The next thing that becomes a part of the Industrial Revolution, don't write anything down about margarine yet, but the idea of the chemical industry began to grow. And we start to see the recovery of more chemical byproducts. If you remember when we were doing the whole little village thing, and we got to the point that the street lights and the street lights, the gas that was produced was a byproduct from producing coke, which was used to make steel. So we see all these chemical byproducts begin to be produced, and engineers and scientists begin to figure out how to use those byproducts. So we start to see more of a chemical industry. So we see increased production of things like sulfuric acid, laundry soap, dyes, synthetic dyes begin to be produced, synthetic plastics begin to be developed. And that's where we get to this whole issue of margarine. Margarine basically is synthetic butter. Probably after you read this, you'll never want to have margarine ever again. Um, but it was a substitute for butter to be used by the poor and to be used by armed forces. And they wanted something that was going to be long lasting and wouldn't spoil. The original margarine was used from beef tallow and skimmed milk. Ugh. Um, and now it's just a other wide variety of oils. So we start to see new centers of industry begin to develop. England still maintains its position as a major producer of, in of industry, but also we start to see Germany. So everything that has this purple is regions that are industrial. So Germany, all of these areas here begin to be parts of major industrial centers. This area here, which is northern France, but also... Belgium also begins to become a center of industry. We also start to see the application of electrical energy to production. Now, this was important because it made fa the factory location more flexible. Again, when you started to see the introduction of steam power to the factories, we didn't have to worry about um, being close to a river. Now, with electricity, you don't have to be worried about being close to sources of coal. Um, so it made fact factory location more flexible and construction more efficient. It also meant that you could run the factories 24 hours a day because you could have night shifts because you can light the factories. The first major power plant was built in Britain in 1881. 
And after that, we start to see homes beginning to use electric lights, streetcars being, being, being built, and subway systems were used with electricity. So now we start to see a greater public transportation system develop, which means, again, people do not have to live right on top of where they work. So the poor doesn't necessarily have to live right next to the grimy, dirty factory they work in. They can actually live a little bit further away and have a little bit of separation from it. Um, we also start to see cartels begin to develop, which is a group of companies working together to try to control prices and production. So we see a lot of this in Germany in the areas of steel and railroad production. Um, and the purpose of the cartels was to protect Germans' domestic industries. In addition, during this time period, we start to see the automobile. So the internal combustion engine begins to be developed. Nicholas Otto was a German inventor who built the first four-stroke internal combustion engine. engine. Um, Gottlieb Daimler began partners with Otto in 1872 and found Daimler Motors. And Daimler used to be a part of Chrysler. It used to be Chrysler Daimler because um, there's still Chryslers today. Um, and so France took the lead originally in automobile manufacturing. But originally, they were just kind of like fancy toys for the rich because you could still go faster in a horse-drawn carriage. Eventually, they began to take off. And then that created a need for petroleum. And so that's why we see during the Second Industrial Revolution, like I said, it's steel, it's chemicals, it's um, electricity. We start to see, again, automobiles, and then we start to see the movement towards a push towards petroleum and new sources of energy. So how was the economy affected by all of these changes in industry? Um, so what we start to see is, surprisingly, um, you would think that business is doing very well, but a lot of banks failed in around 1873, and investment began to slow. Also, this, be ha this occurred because there was a series of bad weather, and because of steam engines and how you could get you know, steam-powered boats, Europe, European farmers begin to have a lot of competition with foreign farmers, and that lowers the price of food, and that created a drag on the economy for the farmers, and that's why you see a lot of immigrants coming out of the agricultural areas into the cities, and then a lot of those people are then leaving and coming to the United States. Overall, people still lived in pretty horrible conditions. However, we are starting to see the growth of a labor movement because labor unrest begins to grow because a sense of class consciousness begins to develop. Now, if you're a farmer and you live off in the countryside, you might know a couple of farmers and you might know your life is miserable, but you might just think that that's just the luck of the draw or why, you know, that might be your particular area of the world that you live in. But now you have all of these urban working class living together in their tenements, talking to other people that work for, you know, all these other different factories, and everyone's beginning to realize that they're being treated equally as horrible, and they're starting to see how... Basically, their plight is very similar and that they're being abused and kind of taken advantage of by their owner, the factory owners. And we start to see this class consciousness to begin to develop. And as a result, we start to see a labor movement begin to develop. And we start to see a growth in trade unions. And we're going to start to see a growth of socialism. And we're going to talk about that later, I think, next week uh, when we get back from Thanksgiving. And as a result of those labor movements and the push for better working conditions and the push for um, better wages, we're going to see overall the standard of living beginning to improve. These new industries produce consumer goods. Um, it was cheaper and more available to even the lower classes. Um, lower food prices, which hurt the farmers, it did mean that the urban working class had larger amounts of their income to spend on consumer goods because they didn't have to focus so much of their income on food. So urbanization also created larger markets. We start to see things like department stores and chain stores and mail order catalogs begin to develop. Now let's look at how did population change as a result of this. And if you, for those of you who took APHG, you would probably know more about this than I do because you learned all about the demographic transition model from Mrs. Ms. Canone. But in the 1900s, 
the percentage of Europeans in the world was 20%. They were 20% of the world's population. It's the largest they are ever going to be. So in 1910, the population of Europe was 447 million. So if we see here, this is the population of England from 1066 to 1900. And we see that it was, it was pretty low, below 5 million for a large portion of its history. And then right around 1570, we start to see a spike which is then brought about what's referred to as the Agricultural Revolution. So the Agricultural Revolution um, is what was the spark for the Industrial Revolution. We talked about this when we talked about why did England, um, why was England the first nation to initiate the Machine Age? Because they started uh, experimenting with different farming techniques. This created more food with less labor. That freed up farmers to then become industrial working class. And so then we see this spike of population that occurs as a result of the Industrial Revolution. So if we look at this map here, we see production versus population. And so right around 1900, right around here, we start to see that production is outpacing population because, they're, because of mechanization, they can produce more things with less labor. And if we look at this map here, this shows us the share of world manufacturing outlook. And so you can see Great Britain in 1900 by far had the largest share of the world manufacturing output with Germany behind them, then France, then the Habsburgs, which is basically Austria, then Russia, then Italy, and then us, the U.S., way far behind, and Japan down at the bottom. Um, and so then if we look at this map below, or chart below, excuse me, rebel level, relative levels of industrialization, again, you could see it's the UK that is the leader, followed behind by the other countries of the world. Um, but, so, what we start to see is a stable or slowly growing populations in the developing world and rapidly growing populations in the undeveloped world. Because in Eastern Europe, the peasants are becoming emancipated, they can move around, they're no longer tied to the land, the population is becoming more mobile. Then you have better forms of transportation, like railroads, like steamships, like better roads, and Europeans begin to migrate out of Europe in record, record numbers. Between 1846 and 1932, 50 million Europeans left Europe. They came to the U.S., they came to Canada, they came to Australia, they went to South Africa, they went to Brazil, and they went to Argentina. Most mid-century immigrants were from Great Britain, particularly Ireland because of the potato famine, Germany, and then Scandinavia. After 1885, the migration from Southern and Eastern European countries rose. Now, what impact did this have on Europe? It actually had a very profoundly good impact because it relieved population pressures, because now then there wasn't so much competition for jobs because 50 million people left and are no longer looking for jobs. It also contributed to the Europeanization of the world, and Europe is going to have a large impact on other cultures, going to have a large impact on our culture and all across the world. So how did the growth of industry affect urban development? Now, between 1850 and 1911, Urban dwellers rose from 25 to 44 percent of the population in France and from 30 to 60 percent of the population in Germany. And many of these people faced poor housing, social anonymity, and unemployment. They went from being in a village where they were respected, where they were known, where people knew their names, to going to these huge cities where they were completely anonymous. Um, ethnic groups tended to live together. We see that even in New York City. If you look at New York City, there's pockets of different populations living together. And they had problems mixing with other groups. We also start to see the cities begin to change in that in the early Industrial Revolution, again, remember your little village that you drew, everything was kind of mixed together. Factories and pubs and churches and schools and tenements. Everything was all just kind of right on top of each other in one big hodgepodge. But what we start to see is cities begin to become more distinct with more planning goes into the cities. Like I talked about in the last video about how Paris was basically torn down and rebuilt using urban planning. And Paris today is now divided into 18 arrondissements, and it all goes in a spiral um, path going around from the center, from the first arrondissement in the center of Paris. And it's all very orderly, and it makes a lot of sense. 
So you start to have cities having separate districts for businesses, separate districts for government offices, separate districts for shopping, separate districts for theaters, and not a lot of people are actually living inside the cities anymore. So if you go to London, the West End is where all the theaters are. The city is where all the business is, kind of like Wall Street and Manhattan. If you go to the city of London, the section of London referred to as the city, if you go there on the weekends, it is a no man's land. There's no one there. A lot of the tube stations are even closed because it's really just open for business during the week. You also, if you go to like Oxford Street, that's where all the shopping is in London. And not a lot of people live in those areas. You have to go into the further outlying neighborhoods, which was made possible because of the tube, which was built in the late 1800s, which made it possible for these new developments to occur. So, and like I said before, Paris was redesigned with these large boulevards and parks. Um, so this is what the early industrialized cities begin looked like, and now they begin to become more planned out. So here we can see, this is the Eiffel Tower, which of course was built by in the late 1800s for the World's Fair. The Parisians hated it originally. Um, and this you can see, this is a view of Paris from the Eiffel Tower. And here you can see another view of Paris from the Eiffel Tower. It's now filled with these long, straight boulevards like you see here, usually ending in some sort of parkland. Um, and it's all very well planned out. And this is all done because of things like public transportation. This is actually uh, a picture of one of the old trolley cars, actually, in Istanbul. Um, and we also start to see with the Paris Metro being built. And we start to see these things built in like the late 1800s, linking the subways to the uh, suburbs, the suburbs linking the suburbs to the interior areas. So we start to see a better planning of the cities. Um, we start to see a lot of the really bad tenements being torn down. Like if you think about infamous slums in New York City, the Five Points area in downtown Manhattan doesn't even exist anymore because all of those tenements and all those slum areas got torn down and they were condemned because of health hazards. And we start to see private land being excavated for the building of sewers and water mains and life in the city begins to become a lot more pleasant. And here you could see me and my friend, my friends Bettina and Joanne and I about to get on the train in Paris. So I want us to think about how did the lives of the people change with the second industrial revolution? How did their lives get better? How did it improve from life during the first industrial revolution?